Welcome fingers, fixers, and feathers back to How It Feels, the only series on YouTube that saw the game with this sprite and decided to take its lore seriously. And how fitting that is since we're taking on Rodion, also known as the gambling ant from the least serious Kanto so far. And right off the bat, I have to say this is probably my favorite character from Limbus Company up to this point. Because while we still have eight other characters without release stories, Rodion is the only one whose story has added nearly as many questions as its answer, to the extent that I had to re-watch some cutscenes multiple times in different orders to finally make sense of what was going on. And by the end of it, I believe she has become the most interesting character to watch, even in the chapters that aren't about her. Dun, 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 dun. But to show you just what I mean, we'll need to start with the facts. Rodion is one of the sinners that make up Limbus Company, as a part of the team tasked with entering the ruins of Lobotomy Corporation to retrieve the Golden Bows. But if you saw the video on Gregor or played the game, you already knew that. But what you may not know is that Rodion stands at 183 centimeters or 6 foot 1 in corroded units, has long copper hair and a devil may care attitude, regularly giving her co-workers nicknames or making light of the dour goings on around her. For example, in Kanto 1, Rodion has offered a job as a mascot to a near stranger during bleak war flashbacks, thrown a cockroach in the face of Gregor, who both has a large roach arm, and is disturbed by roaches for reasons we will not be getting to in this video, and upon noticing that she is bleeding from her ears, all she asks is, is this okay? before dropping to the floor dead, not showing any greater signs of concern. And if these examples give you the sense that Rodion is a character that doesn't take anything terribly seriously and has no sense of anything outside of what she currently wants, then... Maybe! While Rodion fills the point of comic relief throughout the prologue in Kanto 1, Kanto 2 is where things get much more complicated. Kanto 2 comes off the heels of the depressing Kanto 1, where the sinners have failed their first mission, were shown the horrors of war, and made a new friend only to watch her die at the final leg due to whatever the hell this is! And in response to that, their boss, Virgilius, Name one of the most powerful people in the city, refuses to let them forget that failure, tells them that things will only get harder from here, and that if they fail again, they might be all out of a job. So, knowing who Virgilius is, and witnessing him threaten to kill Dante when they didn't follow an order, Rodion's first response is to say, well hey, you know struggling kids need more attention, right? Which. It's just a level of sass I aspire to have. But unlike how the previous Kanto had quite a bit to say about Gregor at every stage, a good segment of this Kanto doesn't have much to say about Rodion. And since, you know, this video is called How It Feels to Rodion, and not a chapter breakdown, let's go through a lightning round of all the events of this Kanto's first half. Number 1. Virgilius continues to berate the sinners until they arrive in District J for the next Golden Bow. Number 2. Faust debriefs the team about how the bow is in a casino, and that their plan is to split into three groups to cause less suspicion. The sinners head to a pawn shop to meet two co-workers that are helping to orchestrate the plan, only to have Don Quixote assault a member of the Ting Tang Gang in the name of justice, leading to a full-on war against them, which causes the supervising co-workers to collectively grab their heads, sigh, and begrudgingly accept the new plan of stealing the Ting Tang Gang's clothes to impersonate them and take part in a gamble at the top of the casino between three other gangs for ownership of the Golden Bow. Number 4. The Sinners dozen raid the Ting Tang Gang's base, this large pagoda surrounded by towers of used cars, and when demanding their clothes are mistaken for an unnamed gang who is known only for their fascination with scents, leading to the Sinners to kill all of them in an effort to avoid having the same reputation as a tier 3 Twitch sub to a hot tub streamer. Number 5. It is revealed that District J is home to a unique currency called Wish Power, which can affect the luck of those that wield it, the Ting Tang Gang, having collected a significant amount for the purpose of winning the gamble, which Dante has now been given, and as the team's executive manager, they take this responsibility extremely seriously, before accidentally spending it all on a jackpot immediately after the disguised sinners enter the casino, blowing their cover and dragging them into a fight against security. And lastly, number 6. Saad and Effie, now seeing two plans be thrown aside for senseless violence, begin to accept that controlling the sinners is pointless. Faust summing up the events so far by saying, I ought to become a Faust that believes in uncertainty. When the lack of a plan becomes the plan, 
all variables become constants. So, did you get all that? If not, don't worry. It all boils down to, nobody believes in the sinners, they constantly fuck up any plans given, and then they succeed when embracing the chaos they created. So following that trail of chaos, the sinners start making their way up to the second floor of the casino where they see a man crying about his gambling losses while dancing in mariachi garb and maracas. Which, you know, is a sight I did not think I would see again after my aunt's boyfriend was kicked out of her trailer at Cinco de Mayo and had to ask for a cab fare home. Good times. Which these in fact are, as the syndicate that runs this floor of the casino are the mariachis, who revel in celebration and see gambling purely as entertainment, and insists that any misery must be channeled into dance. Under the threat of death, of course. The sinners, only wanting to pass through, must engage in this custom if they want to move on without violence. I mean, they could keep fighting? You know, clearly they're all good at it, but for the first time, they're surrounded enough to not feel threatened, but you know, they're in a rush and it just feel like too much effort to force their way through. So, who among the sinners are going to step up to the plate? Why, it's none other than Don Quixote! The other blonde one. While it's mostly by default as every other sinner is terrible at dancing, Sinclair is selected as the tribute to carry the crew for the first time ever, and it makes for what's probably the most beautiful and fun CG that the story has had. Just about everyone depicted having a good time. I mean, look at Hong Lu and Gregor. Look at Vursal with his little pan flute. Look at Sinclair with his calm, sad movement, which clearly has some meaning that we should talk about if this were his video. Because all of this is only important due to Rodion's words of encouragement and insight beforehand. Once Sinclair was singled out, Rodion said that he clearly had experience with dance classes at an upper class school because he walks and talks like a rich person. And when Sinclair looks at her with trepidation asking if he can do this, Rodion... Actually, screw it. She's Roja from here on out. Roja gives this banger of a line, Wrong question, Sinclair. This is something only you can do. Being the first real piece of encouragement or significant show of caring she's given to another person throughout this game, even if it's in her own way. And if you like that, then on the third floor, Rojo does it again by shielding Sinclair's ears while Ryoshu explains to these really crass gangsters even more crass and horrible ways to dismember a body. Look, this part isn't really important to the story. I just think this little doting dynamic in CG is cute and leaves me wondering whether I want to be with her or be. <laughs> Remember how Dante royally fucked up by losing the wish power? Because that's still important. One part of the plan that still remains for the party is winning the gamble between all the gang bosses at the top. And the wish power was going to be used in order to put the odds in the sinner's favor as the Ting Tang gang. But without it, Dante has to go in having no experience gambling due to their amnesia and leave it all to luck. That is, until Roja reveals that she had pilfered wish power from the pawn shop and kept it at her side this whole time. As such, she asks Dante if she can take the role of boss for this part of the mission, which they accept, and Roja goes into the game room alone. And it's here she meets the former scariest boss in the game, an edgy Sephiroth OC, and Sonya. Sonya, being the most interesting of these three, as not only is he dripped out to District Y and back, but it quickly becomes clear that he's an old friend of Roja and that both were founding members of a syndicate known as the Euro Divi until some event caused Roja to leave. Up until now, we haven't heard much about the Euro Divi, other than a passing mention at the pawn shop that they had been shaking down pawnbrokers and were seeking to redistribute the wealth, which Based? But whether it's due to being the lead on the mission or meeting Sonya again, Rojo's suddenly much less relaxed. When Ida mentions that the owner of the casino unfortunately left the area, Rojo immediately calls her out for hiding that he died under mysterious circumstances. And when seeing Sonya, who is now leading the Euro Divi, is trying to obtain a treasure like the Golden Bow, she challenges him on how that lines up with the group's purpose. Sonya then responds, saying that the bow will bring them the means to enact their greater goals, and then goes on and on until he's stopped by the robo-boomer in the room. The four gang leaders then get down to business and agree to their house rules. Whoever has the most chips by the end of three hands gets the bow, no cheating, and absolutely no wish power. And by the last round, all the players seem to be relatively even, and Roja calls out that she's going all in, before gripping her left arm with her right hand. The Codrobot takes notice and immediately calls Roja out, accusing her of using a wish power sticker. Roja then doubles down. She makes a wager that if she does have a sticker, she'll fold. But if she doesn't, then the TQ boss has to admit defeat. The boss accepts, and Roja...
does not have a sticker on her arm. Later stating that this was a feint and she knew that the TQ boss would both be aware of the Ting Tang's collected wish power and could provoke them enough to up the stakes and be willing to take the bet, she had the confidence in herself to win the final hand without using any sort of wish power. Sonya also bowing out at this time. And what puts the cherry on top of this victory is the exchange afterward, where Sod asks her how she could manage all of this, to which Roja says that she doesn't believe wish power has any purpose to her. Wish stickers and all that stuff are all just hopes and desires given important sounding labels. But me? I'm different. I've always believed in myself. And to someone with unshakable faith in themselves, it's nothing more than a weird piece of paper. And look, I know I've fixated on this exchange for a while already, but I just love the answer Roja gives when Yi Song asks how she has that kind of confidence in herself. Just think, I'm the most awesome person in the world, so whatever anyone else says is crock shit. Just look how far we've come since the start of this chapter. From being micromanaged to hell and back after a major failure, to running with the chaos and using the group's own judgement for Roja to pull out an absolute win! We stan a character that looks incompetent, not only winning, not only styling on her enemies, but outright obliterating- uh, LITERALLY! <coughs> so, through means I have yet been able to identify, Sonya summons? A trash compactor to crush the TQ leader upon losing the wager for making baseless accusations. Which is not too surprising for Project Moon Gang leaders, but it's certainly a choice for someone who wasn't posing you a threat. Like I said though, Sonya bows out as a sign of respect, and then Ida does the same and says, You know, wouldn't it be funny if instead I actually killed you and stuffed you with candy? One greatly nerfed fight later, and the sinners make their way to the dungeon where, oops! The security here doesn't respect the results of the bet, and they're forcing debtors to slave away in the mines, and they're trying to tame the Pecatulae abnormalities. Which, I mean, hey, good luck pondering these orbs. Back to the slave labor, Roja pushes Gregor to the front of the pack to help bypass the security, and his method of doing so both looks like and goes about as well as someone trying to start a union at Amazon. Once it fails, Roja says that all these people were either exploiting or exploited all their lives. So it would take a lot more than just a half-hearted speech to speak to them. And you know, I feel like we should take her word for it. You know, it's not like she might have learned it when working with a certain revolutionary leader. Regardless, the security makes the caged abnos rise up for just long enough for the sinners to drive them to bite the hand that feeds them and move on to the next floor where they're greeted by the living embodiment of plastic surgery that serves no purpose to the plot. But this boss is colorful, has a fun design and gimmick, and is named Do you wanna get beat? Hurtily? Come on, how can you not love it? Oh, and it also comes in the pink horny version, I guess, if that's your thing. Which, I mean, hey, I get it. But make sure you get your fill, because that's the hottest thing you're gonna see for a while once the sinners get to the Ice Palace, the final floor of the dungeon. And wouldn't you know it, Sonya's here first, somehow. He found a shortcut, apparently. Which makes about as much sense as how he killed the TQ leader, but who cares? More importantly, he confronts Roja, stating how that this ice palace was a confessional manifested only after she entered the floor, and that the frozen people that are in this palace are also manifestations, but of Roja's neighbors. And it's at this point where Roja is thrown off balance and down the memory staircase. We're shown that both Sonya and Roja came from a small backstreets town in District 25, where the people worked, but barely had enough food to feed themselves, let alone pay for the taxes that the local collectors come for on a regular basis. Feeling frustrated at one notorious collector she calls a leech on those around her, Roja and Sonya formed the Euro Divi, a grassroots group meant to help get food and other resources for the neighborhood. And while Sonya was an excellent speaker to bring more people to their cause, he also advocated for a different kind of action than Roja. While Roja wanted to take direct action to do anything possible to get food, shelter, money, and anything else to their neighbors as soon as possible, Sonya was focused on taking on the larger goal of forming a revolution in the city. Which, you know, has about the same chance as a man named Philip ever finding happiness. Come on. And like any HOA owner, Sonya spent his days more on talking than doing, until a baby got in the garbage and died. Roja, in turn, looked at all this and asked, what the fuck? To which Sonya effectively waved it off with the it happens treatment, and that he can't be bothered with the small stuff since he's working towards the greater good. Seeing this place as a farce, Roja took matters and an axe into her own hands, deciding to confront the tax collector to give up some of her coffers to feed the town. 
And after she refused, Roja decided to cut into her own coffer and take the money by force, giving her neighborhood a veritable feast for the foreseeable future. At least until life gave them the middle finger, because that tax collector was a friend of the middle, a syndicate who doesn't have any interest in finding out who wronged them, but in making sure people know what happens when someone wrongs them. And what happens is a tower of bodies so high that it would make Jack and Pierre swoon in an instant. And as I'm sure you can put together, Roja took this as consigning her entire neighborhood to death. Which, unfortunately, is accurate. The city is a place where no one person acts alone, so anyone in power, like that tax collector, would be certain to have connections to someone larger than themselves. It's unclear if Roja knew this before, but she definitely does now. Knowing that her rash action caused the very thing that she worked to prevent, Roja now carries the guilt of all those bodies on her back, as if she personally stole them, summarizing her feelings in the line, Since that day, nothing I held truly felt like it was mine. All because of me. And at this low point in her confession, Sonia points out that this was all a matter about waiting for the right time, to which Roja responds that someone had to do this, so why not her? But Sonia argues that it was only going to be her, because Roja wasn't doing this for the sake of her town, but for herself. Because high-watching Roja, who looked down on those neighbors she claimed to love, joined a resistance group to save the town, and then quit when she couldn't become the hero, instead going on a crusade of renegade justice herself. She didn't care about helping others. That's just a byproduct of her being the special kind of person she wanted to be. But that's okay, because Sonia can change that. The Euro Divi, now that Sonya's done extensive research, traveled across the city to meet countless people, and plotted out how to escape the exploitation of the ruling class, can now put it all into action. The small towns can have huge harvests instead of garnished wages, everyone can choose to study what they wish, and nobody would be at the risk of starvation. The past can't be undone, but things can be changed as if nothing up to this point had ever happened at all. So long as Roja uses the golden bow she's resonating with to do it. And that idea imprints, both in Roja's mind and her surroundings. It's so comforting and mesmerizing, something that she would never want to forget. But despite all of that, she refuses. Because as warm as that idea and kind of life would be, Roja feels like she should stay in this cold for a while longer. Sonia accepts the answer before talking about how Roja doesn't have something called the Mark, which, you know, not his video, so it doesn't matter. And Roja feels the same, capping off their little therapy session saying that it's not big words behind closed doors that feed your neighbors. So why would a rowdy rascal like her want to join in on all that? Sonia takes his exit, and the Sinners doesn't head to the castle to take on the false neighbors that guard the bow, before realizing this is a Monster House situation. Need to get the hell away before copyright or Mama Baba Yaga crush them into a pulp. Cue the fight sequence that's the closest you'll get to Refraction Railway anymore, and Sonya, showing up again to make the save after Dante, doesn't say they're going to make the world a worse place, allowing the crew to finally succeed in their first mission. And upon getting back and relaying the news to Virgilius, he can't help but be suspicious of Sonya's motivations. But in true Roja fashion, she shuts down the argument by revealing that she's stolen all of the chips that Dante won. So as a reward for their success and windfall, the crew throw a party to celebrate, with Roja flashing a huge smile saying, after all that's said and done, I'm pretty rad, aren't I? Reaffirming her confidence. So that's about it. A pretty happy ending, all things considered. Roja isn't the kind of person who's struggling with much in her life, unlike many of those around her. And while she's made some mistakes, she's a person that's learned to cope extremely well, building up her confidence and achieving self-realization, and being able to carry that sense of accomplishment with you. That is what it feels like to be Rodeo. Is what an utter fool would say. Roja has been a difficult character to pin down. Unlike Gregor, whose actions and motivations are clearly lined up and explained through direct story beats, Roja's story is sprinkled throughout this entire conto, with there being only two scenes that go into deeper detail on her as a person. Compare that to the seven scenes we're given for Gregor in the Kanto 1 dungeon alone, and it's easy to come away from Kanto 2 thinking of this as a simple, lighthearted comedy with themes of guilt and social uprising thrown in. So I decided to watch all the cutscenes a second time, 
And doing that painted Roja in a very different light. Because while there are more details in this Kanto than can reasonably be kept in one video, one part I left out was at the very end of the last cutscene, where when giving her last line, we see there's a flash of distress in her eyes that's instantly covered up by her regular jovial attitude. Throughout the Kanto, we get to see how Roja's confidence, people skills, and swagger carry her throughout all she does. Whether it's from convincing Sinclair to dance for the mariachis, taking point in the gambling match against the other syndicates, or see through Sonia's offer to make a more perfect world. And the story happens to agree with this, showing several times that Sonia, in a few words, is a sanctimonious piece of shit. Remember early in the story where the Euro Divi were shaking down pawnbrokers? Roja brings this up to Sonya when they meet, but Sonya doesn't even acknowledge the question, likely having this play into the acceptable losses idea that his philosophy will abide by. And when diving into Roja's backstory, it only makes sense that she wouldn't only see through this, but be driven to action after one of her own neighbors died, causing the series of events that would forever etch a weighty guilt into her conscience. So, what's a person to do about it? Well, if you're Roja, you run. You get away from the old town, learn to survive using your own street smarts, social skills, and gambling hustle, and find and take everything you can. Just because your own neighbors can't enjoy the good things in life anymore, why shouldn't you? And you tell yourself that, and you survive. And you tell yourself that, and you embrace hedonism. And you tell yourself that, and you tell yourself that, but... No matter what, nothing I held truly felt like it was mine. All because of me. And when you tell yourself that, you make this look. This smile that acknowledges that you've been running for so long, that you're tired, but still so afraid of directly seeing what you've done to those you love. Even the final combat of this dungeon being a reflection of running as the only option. So when she's shown a caricature of what could have been, it's not only tempting, but insulting. Immediately after Roja confesses her own sin, Sonia insists that she cannot rewrite the past, but then shows Roja's memories, this time painted over with all the promises that he's made and the rose-colored life they could be living if she would just take his hand, contradicting himself almost immediately. But again, Roja sees through this false paradise, despite this guilt. And not unlike someone who got stuck with the one guy at the party who will just not stop talking, she rejects the offer, showing that despite her mistakes, she knew Sonya would not make the right call. And that strength to refuse a paradise? To stay firm to what you believe in? I think that would be so beautiful. If it wasn't absolutely wrong and Sonya was actually right, because if we look back at Kanto 1, we can see that Gregor's visions of the smoke war were not based on pure facts, but of his own memories mixed with his emotions. And since this is the same situation as Roja, we can safely say that Sonya was not controlling the scenes displayed, but that they were simply Roja's interpretations of his words. As if she was ignoring how Sonya said the past couldn't be overwritten. Because unlike Roja, Sonya is thinking in a much more calculated manner to accomplish a much more meaningful goal. Instead of only ensuring someone can eat for a day or two, Sonya has taken extensive time to build up resources so that those who need to can eat forever. And while the Eurodivier has shaken down pawnbrokers for money, they haven't gone so far as a tax collector to take from people's homes, nor take on an enemy they couldn't safely defeat. And to illustrate this, let's look back at the end of the card game. As baffling as I still find the method of murder here, there is a very clear difference with how Roja and Sonya go about enacting a kind of vigilante justice. Roja made the choice based on emotion and a sense of justice to kill the tax collector and save her fellow neighbors, leading to dramatic consequences. While Sonya seemed to have needlessly killed the TQ leader, but when explaining that this was for baseless accusations being dangerous, he managed to take out the leader of an opposing gang with a justification others would accept before that gang posed any potential danger. In other words, Roja reacted to an immediate need and made a dangerous situation, while Sonya was proactive and removed a potential obstacle to prevent a dangerous situation. And this is the main difference between the two of them. Sonya plans ahead, and Roja improvises. And why is that? Well, it's just like Sonya said. Whether she knows it or not, 
Roja's reason for acting is because she thinks she's special and won't accept any sign otherwise. She not only said as such after the Syndicate's gamble, or showed Sinclair how she thinks when encouraging him, but as Sonia puts it, chose not to accept his offer out of a fear. That fear being that in a world that has no problems, it'd be terribly boring and nobody would see her as special. <laughs> Poor Rodion. Dear, you seem to be under the delusion that you're some sort of savior. Those being of the last words she would remember before putting her community in harm's way. Sonya saw this and chose to go a different direction, trading in the small wins that would risk his community for small steps to build up to the bigger picture. And where does that leave Roja? As a runaway, trying to satisfy her ego with this lifestyle, always on a breaking point should it not be fulfilled. And doesn't that remind you of someone else? Someone who was obsessed with being a savior for the masses, deluded to the extreme, but when given the opportunity for peace, would break and cause havoc in the worst way possible? That's right, Roja's character is on par with the Queen of Hatred, which confirms we're getting that as her Vav ego move. Let's go! Okay, I'm sorry. This is the last time I pull a fake out in this video, I promise. But I wanted you to understand how many layers of information that I went through trying to explain the story of this character. Because the truth is, neither Roja nor Sonya are right. Sonya talks about wanting to start a rebellion, but the only action we've seen him take when leading the Euro Divi is killing another leader and shaking money out of some small pawnbrokers. Anything else being a form of research, talking, and planning no direct action while those around him fall. And Roja, while aware of this, is split between truly wanting to help those less fortunate, move past the guilt for her mistake, and cling to her indomitable confidence in herself that's allowed her to move this far. But while you could argue that both of these characters are two sides of the same coin, I would argue that Roja is the tiniest bit further along in realizing herself than Sonya. By the end of the Kanto, Sonya has been challenged on his views several times by Roja, but either outright ignores those challenges, brushes them off, or talks about how Roja simply doesn't understand well enough to accept his ideology, never questioning himself even when reporting his failure to Herman. And Roja does that to a large degree too, but also shows that she's been affected by the challenges to her own ideology. That smile at the end not simply being a crack in her confidence or her guilt showing through, but the beginnings of a crack in Roja's own identity. Now that she's been directly confronted by her past through a means that she can't evade, she has to accept her guilt in failing to help those around her. And a necessary part of that is to break down her facade of confidence that she's leaned on and move forward with her direct action, truly intending to help those she cares about. And change is hard, no matter who you are. But I think a lot of people, myself included, can understand what it's like dealing with some difficult situation by lying to yourself, by telling yourself you're someone you're not, or by convincing yourself there's a way that the world works. And from that foundational lie, you build up some real, genuine betterment. But at the end of the day, it's still confidence based on a lie. And at some point, we all end up confronting it. And I think something as intense as what Roja went through and how hard she's clinging to that lie, in the worst case scenario, confronting it can be so hard it could truly break a person. But until then, she'll stay in the cold, waiting for the frostbite to break through her arguments, finding ways to forget until that day comes. And this comforting uneasiness, guilt, emptiness, and utter confidence are all a part of how it feels to be Roja. Fingers, fixers, and feathers, thank you so much for watching this video. As you may have guessed, this took quite a bit of work to simply understand, let alone edit together. And while I see this channel as having a long way to go in general, I felt like it was time for me to set up something a little bit extra to help keep the videos going. So if you like my videos and want to support making more of them outside of referring my editing services, I now have a Patreon linked in the description, where any patron will have their name shown as a supporter at the end of the video and can get early access to new videos as well 
well as behind the scenes info, some of the tools I use to make these, and tips about how you can make your own. And over here, expect some weekly uploads for a while, but now that we've had an episode two come out for this Limbus series, I think it's time for me to start an episode two of something else. Until then though, take care goons, check you later.